This is the Aftermarket Radio Network. Welcome to the Auto Repair Marketing Podcast with Brian and Kim Walker. We are coming to you live from STX in Orlando. We are. It's beautiful. I love it. No snow. It's pretty. I'm excited to be here. And just to make set the frame for you guys that are listening out there, Kim has her back to the view, which is overlooking Epcot Center, the pool here at the Marriott. The so, World Marriott. This is the largest Marriott in the world. Did you we, know that? No, I didn't know that. Yep. Yeah, we just learned that. It's a pretty beautiful place. We're sitting up in the Marriott boardroom right now. We don't have permission to be here. We just kind of walked in like you're we tell, own the you're place. You're telling people that? <laughs> Heck yeah. <laughs> Logano, El Logano. You got to have somewhere to set up a... You know, a podcast studio. Y'all, literally, we walked into the boardroom like we own it. It's ours. We booked it. We paid for it. And we're, we've got, Brian has all this equipment set up everywhere like it's his. Which he carried in in a gun case to the 11th floor. That is, that is a whole funny story by itself. <laughs> that was the one that I did not think through when I, when I got the, uh, the case for the podcast equipment. I bought a, a Pelican rifle case. <laughs> and here we come walking into a 20 some story hotel where we have a room with a balcony overlooking the swimming pool. And I'm going up there with a gun case. And what, about the time that we were walking in the door, I'm like, oh, my gosh, that's when it hit me. And I just knew that I was going to get stopped. But yeah, but the funniest things, the two guys in the elevator, they were looking and I was like, it's not a gun. It's not a gun. And they were like, no, we, we just think you're probably having more fun than we are. <laughs> That's crazy. So, we anyway. need to put like a whole bunch of stickers on it, like podcast. I love podcasting. You know, Carm probably has 800 stickers relating to podcasting. So yep, that's a pretty good idea. Oh, that is a great idea. I need to do, oh, you're I, welcome. I need to do weekly blitz pot, uh, weekly blitz stickers with the QR code on it. So exactly. they can scan it and go right. to the player. Oh, Chris, that's ah, smart. There you go. So I'm I, so glad so I Look, took what done. you had and then added a level to it. I'm yeah. done for the day. Yep. Thank you to our friends at repair pal for providing you this episode. Repair pal is the key that unlocks more business for your repair shop. Learn more at repairpal.com forward slash shops. You've, you've heard his voice now. We probably should introduce right. our oh. guest. He just jumped right just in. He didn't in wait. Corner. Yeah, I don't have time for that. I'm just all in. So our guest today is Chris Cotton with AutoFix, and you also know him from the Weekly Blitz with Chris Cotton. Hey, everybody. Glad to be here. I'm glad they invited me. Of course, we're all here working, but we, again, we hijacked the boardroom, and we're here. Brian actually put the word work in quotes Yesterday on his Facebook post, he said he took a picture from our balcony overlooking this amazing facility, the pool, beautiful sunshine. And he said, some days at quote work are better than others. And it, it and really they are. is true. But what? Well, yeah, I'm going to say that. But a lot of people don't realize what we do. Like I have family members that they don't like they're Chris. What do you really do? And I don't think people realize how exhausting going to and doing a four hour training session is yeah, and everything real. else like you and Kimberly this morning, she's like, I feel like I have to turn on when I'm with you now. And we're walking <laughs> through because people are coming up and they're asking you questions and you like, you're not even, I was in uh, my workout clothes this morning and the guy pokes me in the back and says, Hey man, I did your class yesterday. It was great. And she's like, I feel like I have to put on this persona and, she is and go Brian. through with you. Yeah. They really oh, are yeah. the that same twins. person. That same, is, same birthday, same everything. So, and, and just to eliminate any confusion, so Chris's wife is named Kimberly. Mm -hmm. And, of course, you know, my wife, the other host of this podcast, of course, is Kim. But one goes by Kim and one goes by Kimberly. So when we're talking, that's how you differentiate. Kim is me. Kimberly is, is Chris's, Chris's wife. Is Chris's wife, yeah. Who's not here. I thought she was going to come. <laughs> Join me today. No, she left me with these two guys and she's soaking up some sun. She's today. at the pool. She quote unquote turned on this morning for like an hour to, to greet people and she's exhausted now. Bless so she's heart. by the pool. Yeah. So she's I, got I do. I feel her pain. <laughs> it's the same way when I go anywhere with Kim, especially in our hometown. We can't like there's a there's an event every year called Hot August Night. We walk around and we cannot go 10 feet without having to stop and talk to someone for five minutes. We just and went for a walk around the university the other day. It drives me nuts. But at the same time, it's great, what you it's great for, for our business. Right. So, you know, but, but I absolutely feel her pain. And I was thinking earlier, 
I shouldn't think this way. And I apologize for all the clients and people that stop me out there because I'm, I'm not complaining about it. It's just when I start thinking about everything it takes to get ready and go to a conference and the training and everything, that's the part I dread. I love teaching the class. I love talking to shop owners from all across the country. It's just a preparation. I, I guess the mind suck is just like physically and mentally draining. And then, and then of course, Brian got all of us started on 75 hard and then um, backed out on us. But Ooh, <laughs> um, so, out. so Kimberly and I've been getting up at like 5 a.m. every morning so we can get our morning workouts in and get everything else done. Real reason. So you have plenty of time to drink that gallon of water. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. Cause you know, that's the other thing teaching a four hour class. You know, I'm, I'm not as young as I used to be and the bladder's not as strong. So like you're, <laughs> I'm almost 50 in front of a classroom for two hours before the break. And I'm like, I'm like, okay, let's take a break. But I'm the first one that sprints out of the room. So anyway, that's I got up this morning for my workout. I've already taken a, what, an hour, hour and a half nap already this morning. Ah, uh, so workout then now. Yeah. Well, look, this podcast is about marketing. <laughs> okay. So we should probably do some of that. Yeah. Right? Let's, let's, let's talk about that. So, you know, we, we've got Chris here. Chris is a, uh, a coach for auto repair shop owners and he sees a lot with what's happening in, in their businesses. So, you know, Chris, just to kind of get us started, what are some of the biggest mistakes that you see shops making in their marketing? I think a lot of them, they don't have any type of plan. It's just everything's willy nilly. And they're just like, oh, today I'm going to do one Facebook post. And then they don't do a Facebook post for three years. Like, like I get <laughs> I get all kinds of shop owners that they're like, hey, you know, I want your help. And then so when somebody signs on board with us, we go through and we look at their social media. We go through the, and then we also work with you guys to to evaluate some of that. And it drives me nuts to see a Facebook page for a repair shop that hasn't been touched since 2018. And so there's there's no written plan. There's no follow through, uh, just lack of consistency. And then two, shop owners now, the last couple of years, it's been so good that, you know, okay, I don't need a web page. Like we were just talking about a shop. I'm not going to name them here, but we're just talking about a shop. It's a great shop doing almost $2 million a year, which is awesome but I click on their website and it takes me to a Facebook page. And so when things turn, are they going to be prepared for that? Like you have to be, we talked about it in my class yesterday. Like, I don't know. I had everybody raise their hand that people that have been in the business 10 years or longer, less than half had been in business longer than 10 years. So all those other people have never gone through economic downturn. Like they weren't around in 2008, mm -hmm. 2010, yeah. and they don't know what it's like. And I told them, I said, you, you need to make friends now with a shop owner that lived through that so that you can make it through. So right. just complacency. Well, and they're also doing 15 things, right? right? So at some point they get so busy doing all of the different things that they do, wearing the different hats and uh, something's got to give. Yeah. And that's it. Yeah. Like I don't have time to do a video. I don't mm -hmm. have the time to do this. And then the other thing is, is like everybody's scared of video, but for crying out loud, I, I stopped and did a video on a donut wall yesterday that's, <laughs> that was here at the thing, which, which was amazing. That's like one of the most amazing things I saw yesterday was the donut wall. Well, so You just hit on something, though, that I think is going to be a major topic here sometime in the next couple of years. And look, I don't know if it's going to happen this year or, you know, a few years from now or what. But a lot of these shop owners have got a false sense of security right now because things have been so good, like to not make it with an auto repair shop right now, you're doing something very wrong. It is an easy business to succeed in, you know, aside from like the tech shortages and, and stuff like that, but just getting cars in, doing the repairs and, you know, selling the work as a, as a profit, that's not a difficult thing to do right now. Most of the shops that we know are thriving. We're in a bull market right now. And at some point that's going to turn into a bear market and shop owners are going to feel that the effects from that. Well, and then too, I think one of the things I talked about is, is technology and how rapidly things are changing. Like we're doing things now that we weren't even doing 18 months ago, mm -hmm. let alone three years ago, five years ago, 10 years ago. And I talked about it. Some of the people in that class weren't very old. I was like, I remember a bag phone in the car. And then we went from bag phone to brick phone to flip phone mm -hmm. to smartphone and everything. And I feel like our industry still like we're in the flip phone age, like, right. We've, ex we've, ex we've expanded a little bit, but not as much as we need to. And there's so much, there's so many people coming from outside the industry now that have a ton of money. Like I had a, I had a guy reach out to me. He got a million dollars in PPP money. He owns a tech company. 
and he wanted to start a shop because it was pandemic proof. And this guy before, he didn't even have a name for the business, a logo, nothing. Mm-hmm. He was contacting people like me to, to set that business up and get it going. And then of course, you know, I'm passing on to you guys and this is, this is their competition now. And it's not like it used to be. Yeah, it used to be that you were competing against a bunch of technicians right. who became shop owners. Mm-hmm. And now those guys are having to compete against like legit business professionals, businessmen who, who know their stuff when right. it comes to profitability and, and just, just well, running a stream yeah, of was, business. Well, and, and the other thing is if they don't know it, they're not afraid to go out and hire help to be like, I don't know. I don't know. The, I know the tech space, but I don't know auto repair. Teach me everything exactly. you know about auto repair. Yeah, that's exactly what happened uh, in one of my classes. I think it was at ASTE last year. Front row sitter, right? Guy comes in front row, which is kind of rare. Doesn't happen often. He sits on the front row asking questions, highly engaged and I'm thinking in my head while I'm teaching the class, how do I not know this guy? Like he's here to learn. He's, you know, he, I'm thinking he's somebody who attends training a lot. Like how have I not met him? And so we talk at the break. Sure enough, he's big shot corporate guy who has been CEO of multiple organizations in the business world and said, I just bought a shop that was failing. Um, it was an older shop owner who didn't want to deal with all of the new technology and I bought this shop and he had only had the shop like six months and was already breaking a million dollars, was taking my class so he can continue to continue to learn more. What he what he picked up on, it happened in my class, in the middle of my class, <laughs> Craig O'Neill and Chris Clochier, Clochier, Clo- however you say, I'm from Louisiana, I can't even say it. He opens the door, they walk in just to say hey, and Scott Palava is sitting in the back corner and they like come into the middle of the class, hug it out. Hey, I haven't seen you in so long. Meanwhile, corporate guy sitting on the front row is like, what kind of kumbaya place <laughs> is happened. this? I mean, but we were talk. we use that as an example to talk about the relationships you build in this industry. That's what, you know, I thought about when you said that is here he is six months in already breaking a million dollars, came from the corporate world, but understands he already had a coach and he was already involved in training to, to better himself. And I, I need to follow up with him and see how he's doing now. But he was already talking about buying another shop. Yeah. I mean, I had a, I had a guy that the phone call was, Hey, Chris, I made my millions off of neon signs. That's what he did. Like that's the business he knows is neon signs. And I think it was in South Carolina. And he goes, I bought a repair business because they had like a 15,000 square foot facility. And I wanted all the extra space they had to make signs in. But now I want to make the actual repair business work. And he just ate yeah. it up, ate it up with a spoon. The other thing that I was, is completely off topic, but that's the way my brain works. For such a big industry, it's so small and so tightly knit. Like, like we'll stop and we'll be talking in a group or down by the pool. And I was talking to somebody and then next thing you know, they're like, oh, my shop's just a couple miles from you. And yeah, I know you and I know you. Mm-hmm. And there's so many of those conversations. It's just amazing how tight knit the industry is. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, knowing things like this, knowing that there's this, this false sense of security, knowing that there are people coming in from the corporate world and buying up shops that are going to be your competition. What does that mean for, you know, a shop owner with it and their marketing? Marketing wise, they just need to make sure that they're on the forefront of whatever's happening. Like things that work now didn't work six months ago. And then you'll see things like roll back through all of a sudden. And so you have to be The other thing is, is a shop owner can't be on top of it all the time, right? They really have to be just like a shop owner needs a coach. They need somebody to help them with the marketing. They have to have somebody that watches that and watches the industry and knows just, just like the crazy stuff with indeed lately. If you're not watching that, you miss out on it. Same thing for you guys with marketing. If you're not watching it, you miss out on it. And a shop owner doesn't have time to do that. And again, you just have to make sure that the marketing's on point, make sure that you're doing things differently. People, Again, go back to the flip phone, the brick phone, generic Facebook posts with images is not cutting it. You have to have video like video. You have to be doing videos and a lot of them now. I love talking about sponsors of the podcast who have already worked with and who have used before. So today I'm super excited to talk to you about RepairPal, which if you didn't know, will introduce your shop to new customers through RepairPal.com, the largest site for auto repair and through the recommendation of their partners like USAA, CarMax, and Consumer Reports. Our shop was in RepairPal's certified network, 
and it was great for getting new customers who were looking for more than just oil changes. The average Repair Pal customer spends over $600 on their first visit. I loved it, especially because we all know that consumers still mistrust repair shops. But the millions of customers that visit RepairPal.com monthly, they trust RepairPal certified shops for their high quality and great service. And there's no fear about being overcharged. So we were able to just focus on the repair. I highly recommend you check them out. It's the way to grow your business. Go to RepairPal.com forward slash shops, get one month of service free, and save $150 off certification. So we're doing a class today. It, we'll, we'll be doing this in a few hours on no like trust marketing. And that's one of the things that I talk about a lot is that, you know, when it comes to marketing, people always want to fall into the, the shiny object syndrome. You know, they hear about things like, oh, well, I, w- I want to do geofencing. You know, I want to do uh, real time bidding or omni channel. You know, they, they want to go with the, whatever the buzzword is in marketing. But there are the these things in marketing that are just truths that never change. And one of those things is that people do business with people they know, like, and trust. That will never change. The way that you get people to know, like, and trust you, you know, with as new marketing channels come along, that may change. But when it comes to things like your social media, your Facebook posts, you know, your website itself, the emails that you're sending out, all of the ways that you're communicating with, with your clients, what are you doing to make people actually know, like, and trust you. And, you know, a lot of people are just doing these like generic posting just for the sake of getting Mm -hmm. a post done for the day, but they're not doing things that are actually going to build a relationship. Well, there's no purpose or thought behind it. Right. And, and sometimes, I mean, you can post something just off the whim and it's going to be great, but for the most part, you really need to, like you were saying earlier, what's your plan? What's your purpose? Don't waste the time. Time is so precious. And shop owners have so little of it. If they're doing all the things, they really, you need to take the time to sit down and and actually come up with a plan and think about what's your purpose? What are you trying to do here? What's your goal that you're striving for? But, you know, I also want to want to say that there are some shop owners who can do their own marketing and do a brilliant, great job at it. I think that Michael O'Brien that we were talking to in our class the other day, Reliable Automotive, I think he, you know, he He's a numbers guy. He was sitting there like asking incredible questions, talking about things that he was going to do. And I think you have to go back to what is that book? Uh, Find your strengths or strength finder. Chris, I think you talk about that sometimes. And if you're gifted in that area and it's something that you feel like you can really do, try it, you know, put your foot out there, try it, see how it goes. If that's not a strength of yours, then it's time to have someone else do that. You know, we all have things we're good at and we have things that we're not good at. And, and we've always said, you know, one big tip for in business is surround yourself with people better than you right? and, you know, outsource the things that you're not good at. So, well, a lot of shop owners, they're so busy working in the business that they can't, they don't have time to work on it. Like things like this, Mm -hmm. just complete transparency. You guys handle all my marketing. I don't have time for that. You know, I've been through, I've, Google AdWords certified, ways certified. I keep up with the industry and know what needs to be done. Mm-hmm. But even for me, I don't have time to do that. I could make time and time block it. But if there is a shop owner out there that's not so busy working in it, mm-hmm. that they can work on it. If you can do some time blocking and mm-hmm. come up with a couple hours a day and do it, then that's great. Right. The The one thing I would say, the thing that I'm surprised doesn't work better, even though I noticed I pulled up my phone last night and they must have a geofence around the conference. There were two coaching companies that popped up that aren't even here. So I think that's interesting. But the other thing that I would never, ever in my life spend money on is postcards. And all of a sudden, it seems like there's a little resurgence in postcards. Like one of my clients recently, he's like, Chris, I did a thing. And I was like, what are you talking about? He's like, well, don't shoot me. (laughs) He goes, I know you don't like it. But he goes, I went out and did a postcard campaign and I got a a brand new customer that came in here and approved an $8,000 ticket first visit. And I was like, well, if, if you can, so here's the other thing that shop owners don't do that they should do is they don't track and measure like Mm -hmm. anything like customer comes in and they go, Hey, how'd you hear about us? And everybody says Google, because that's, that's what they say. Like it may not be the truth at all, but, Mm -hmm. and that's the extent of their tracking. Right. So, yeah, no, that's, you just brought up something really important is 
Google could be, oh, I clicked on an ad. It could be I searched for you. It could be a number. Google could be so many different things. Right. It, they also used to say, oh, I found you online. Oh, my gosh. Do you know how many different things that could mm-hmm. really be? Well, when you talk about, you know, postcards, one of the things that I've learned over the years is you don't discredit any any type of marketing. You know, there are things out there that like everybody assumes that, you know, well, these things work. These things don't work. Uh, oh, I tried doing this. That didn't work for me. You know, their email is dead. Yeah. I mean, I won't like the one thing that I will often start to discredit. But even then, there's a disclaimer on it is like the yellow pages. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, depending on who your audience is, right. that might be something that's actually a relevant, you know, way of, of marketing. But yeah, you know, direct mail, uh, billboards, uh, we've done radio with great success. I've never personally done television, but I heard of a shop recently. It was someone who was in my class and they were telling me about the television advertising they were doing and just how well it was. But, you know, you think about about direct mail. Well, email kind of replaced direct mail for a long time. But People's email inbox has become so full. Oh, yeah. And so many companies transitioned from sending direct mail pieces to, you know, sending emails. Email is still incredibly effective, but that physical mailbox, it's nowhere near as full of the junk mail as it used to be. Right. You know, the the junk mail that I tend to get now is all from the credit card companies, but it used to be, you know, the the mailers for all your local businesses. All and the very few of those yeah. do that anymore. So now it's something that can actually stand out again. And we'll see, you know, people may go back to that and then fill up people's mailboxes again and it becomes less effective, especially in the beginning. Any marketing channel that you typically use, like if you're not doing direct mail and all, then all of a sudden you start doing it, you can have a great impact with it in the beginning and then it'll typically slow down. So you have to be really strategic about who you're sending to, where you're sending it to, and what that message is that you're putting out there. As a shop owner, do you have time to to stay on top of the trends like this and know what's working and what isn't working and how it flips back and forth? Again, you need to have people helping you watch or at least be paying attention to the industry so you catch on it. Well, and and sometimes you you will, um, depending on who, like I know those shop owners that are just, they are genius marketers and that is what they do. That's where they spend their time. And, you know, for those, for those people that, you know, they don't ever get into the other places in the business that the typical shop owner might, you know, especially the ones that come from the corporate world, they, they don't work on cars. I mean, you were a shop owner. You, you were never a technician. Never. You know, like, so that, I'm the last person you want fixing your car, touching your car. <laughs> yeah. I could probably Google it, but yeah, I don't <laughs> fix your business. Yes. Fix your car. No. But when you were doing that, you were looking at things that the shop owner who does know cars you know, the the person who does understand, like they fix cars, it's very difficult for that person to completely remove themselves from the shop. But you never having been a tech, you were able to really focus in on those things that truly matter when it comes to running a business. And that may have been things like your marketing, but definitely all of your, your numbers. For sure. The numbers. Yeah. Well, you know, we taught a class at vision a couple of years ago and it was about the foundations of marketing. And that's kind of what we really like to preach is, you know, you mentioned the silver bullets, the flashy, you know, new things. And, and those are great. And we think that you, you know, you should try that. But what's most important is really making sure you have the foundations in place. And there are some of those things that shop owners still even, I mean, do we call this post pandemic? But, um, you know, one, one of the things that caused us to really grow so much in the last couple of years was during the pandemic, these shops realized, okay, everything's moving online and I need a website or I need to really get this in order. I need to get that in order. And there, that's some foundational things that they have to do. And I don't think you should branch out and try some of these flashy, you know, trendy things until you've got your house in order when it comes to marketing. And we were just talking about when do you try those or, or do you do that? And it's easy to get distracted by some of those things. So really getting your, your house, your marketing house in order. Well, and I know like, I can't even, I can't believe it's been two years ago. Like March of 2020 is when everybody kind of puckered and and pulled back in and they're like, Chris, you know, we're cutting, we're shutting off marketing. We're shutting off everything. We're, we're, we don't know what it's going to be. So we're just cutting off everything. And I was like, look, let's don't do that. Let's go at it full bore. And we went from doing one of the things that I was telling everybody, like 
all these people are sitting at home on Facebook, like Facebook exactly. viewership went up, people at home went up yep. and we started posting videos, like several videos a day. And then people kept calling and we were picking up. It was just, it's just, a, I can't believe that's been two years ago. Well, you know, those are the shops, you know, it was funny. We, we had shops who excelled from the beginning, right. right. And just coasted right through, did unbelievably well, but they had their marketing house in order. Right. Right. And then there are the ones who very quickly realized, wait a minute, they need, they want to schedule their appointment online. They want, like you were saying, I, I need to, my, I haven't posted on Facebook in three years. Right. And right. so realizing got a lot of people up to speed. But the, the actual people that I saw pull back for whatever reason, like they, it's, it's kind of a personal choice with a lot of things at that point, but the people that pulled back, they didn't do so well. And the people, some of them pulled back and then they're like, oh, I'm going to take the money and then close. And then we had shops in areas like we had a, at a shop in a town, there's like seven good repair shops in this town. Five of them stayed open, two of them closed everybody's business grew. And then those people went to reopen three months later, all their customers have gone somewhere else. Yeah, right. Right. And right. never returned. And then they yep. en ended up closing completely. Right. It's one of the things that I learned in business is that you never, ever take your foot off the gas. Right. It doesn't matter how well you're doing. Like you can have more business than you could possibly handle. You still do not take your foot off the gas because all that that does is it leads to this roller coaster of, you know, business one, one week you're up one week you're down and there's nothing consistent about it. It makes it very difficult on, on yourself for being able to predict cash flow, And it makes it very difficult on your technicians, especially if they're flat rate, you know, the worst thing in the world that you can have in your shop is a flat rate technician sitting there with nothing to do because that will cause, you know, attitude problems. Like it, it you know, nobody, nobody likes that, you know, mm -hmm. it's the, the financial issues, the employee issues. So you always want to run your business where it feels like, man, I can't handle it anymore. And, you know, it doesn't matter if it is your marketing, your processes, you always want to look for ways to be better and not just be complacent. So staying in that growth mindset, stop stopping, yeah. right? Well, and, and again, people, I heard it, I heard it yesterday. We can't find technicians where, yeah, they're out there, people. You just have to. One of the things that I did yesterday is I'd ha I had everybody write their labor rate from 10 years ago and then write down what it is now. And then everybody stood up and said their name, where they're from and what their labor rate was. And I about had a heart attack. I got to a group of guys that were all from Seattle and their labor rate 10 years ago was like $89. And now their labor rates $119. I've got shops in Seattle. We're paying $60 an hour for technicians. Like we're way past that, especially in Seattle. And, and somebody asked me, well, what should we do? And I was like, you need to decide if you really want to hire the technicians. And if you really want to hire them, you have to make the pay commensurate what, with what they need to have and then adjust your labor rate accordingly. And, and it is what it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, you know, I don't want to turn this into a labor rate podcast right. because no. we could easily go there. Yeah. But I will tell you that every single time that we raised our labor rate in our shop, we didn't have a single complain about yeah, it. No not, I cannot look back at any single time where we had a complaint about our labor. And rate. sometimes it was a significant hike. I remember we, we the first the one for sure. Right. The first time, of course, you know, it was right after we joined in with, with, you know, we got a coach and we, we I, gosh, I think we almost doubled it the first time. Like it was something really significant and I hate numbers freak out. <laughs> so when, when we decided to do that, I was like, oh my God, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to close. Like, nope, not a single thing blew my mind. Well, and the most talked about it yesterday in class, the most I've ever had to do for a shop was $60 an hour. He called me up and like, an increase of 60 an hour. Yeah. One yeah. time. Yeah. So he was, he was in the sixties. And called me up and said, Chris, I'm going to lose my business. When somebody calls me, I have zero emotion to anything. Like I'm running, I'm helping them run the business. I don't know who their employees are or anything else. And I love their employees, but I don't care. It's not about the employees for me. It's about the business. And if we can make it run great, then the employees will, will flourish with that. But I told him, I said, we're going to have to go from like $68 to $128. He's like, oh, Chris, but if I do that, I'll go out of business. I'm like, you already told me you're going to go out of business. So this is like the Hail Mary. I'm sorry. You waited way too late to call me. And as far as I know, that was about seven, eight years ago. As far as I know, he's still in business today. 
None of his customers complain. No, we, people are way more parts price conscious than they are labor price conscious. Yeah. So when it comes to marketing, what are the KPIs that you tend to look at uh, the most? If you're, if you're looking at AdWords, of course, like some of the pay-per-click, but for me, I'm a track and measure guy. So I want to know what we send out, how we send it out, and then tracking and measuring it. Like, did this campaign work? If not, how do we adjust it? And then from there, it was wildly successful. So how, how do we do that? And then go from there. And then two, if we find a campaign that worked and it was successful, how soon can we do that one again? Like there was um, one of my 20, 20 groups, we were talking about it and they did uh, free brake pads and everybody in the room about had a heart attack, but their average repair order with a zero set of brake pads was almost $800 a ticket. And this is a general repair shop, so that's not bad. And their total return that they tracked back to that was $110,000. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Not bad. No. Some sets of, you know, giving away some sets yeah. of brake pads. And so he had all the tracking on all that. And of course they, they did the other recommended maintenance items and everything with it, but tracking and measuring. And so I'm, I'm going to throw that back to you. Like, like you do a good job of, of tracking and measuring and doing the inbound calls. That's the other thing is being able to track a call to an actual ad instead of just the number or whatever. Cause a lot of people can claim that their marketing works, but when you really, really dig into it, it's like, well, did it or didn't it? And then mm-hmm. this really came from that campaign versus something that didn't come yeah. from that campaign. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's the class we taught yesterday yeah. here at SDX. I mean, ultimately it comes down to the total return on investment on right. your marketing. And one of the things that, so, you know, we can't track that for the, the client. The yeah. client has to get in there and do that themselves because, you know, actually matching up the, uh, you know, a click through a Google ad to a form fill to the actual sale that happens. There's some manual work that has to go into that. I mean, we do track, we track, you know, the conversions and we track reach and impressions and we track how many people clicked the ad and, you know, all that kind of stuff. But you do have to, so you can see on that end because we are tracking, but... Yeah, we give them all of the marketing numbers, but to be able to, to look at it and see the actual dollar return on investment... They've got to get in there and do some manual work to see that. But one of the things that uh, that is so often forgotten about is what are you actually paying the marketing agency to right. do it? Because people will look at, oh, well, I spent this much on Google. It cost me this much per click. And they they figure that. But they don't figure it, the rest of but it. They don't they don't figure all of it. Just take so. it one step further. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, and and so the other thing is, is, is most all of the point of sale systems have a marketing source report in there and you can set up a campaign. You can do. You can do like one campaign for Google or like you said earlier, you could be, okay, so was that a Google web search? Was it Google AdWords, whatever? And then you can also say, okay, was it a Facebook ad or was it this free breaks thing? And then there's also breaks for breasts every year in October. Where did that come from? And you can also force that in so that your service advisor can't go to the next screen until they put that in and actually physically ask for the question. And so I tell a lot of shop owners all the time, make sure that you're doing that. And, and then two on the tracking, I love QR codes, QR codes went away and COVID brought them back. Cause now mm-hmm. you can't go to a place typically without mm-hmm. scanning them for a menu. I was wearing a shirt down at the pool yesterday with a QR code on the back of it. Mm-hmm. And, and so this is a huge fail. This is like a lesson learned. People were coming up and scanning it, but it was outside in the sunlight and it didn't work. So I had like six, oh. I had like six people stand up while I was talking to them yesterday. And I don't think anybody could get it to work, but anyway. So again, tracking, and then you have a QR code. So then you have a bit.ly link to it. So you can look and see how many people click that and, and everything. Yeah. There's some amazing ways to track and measure. So what's your number one piece of advice to help shop owners when it comes to their marketing? Have a plan. And if you don't have time to make a plan, get with somebody that can help you make a plan. I mean, you, you have to have a plan. Like, So I talked about time blocking, but you need to have like a marketing calendar. Like, okay, on Tuesdays, I'm going to create these three videos either for myself or for the team, or I'm going to get this ready and get it together and get it to the marketing team. But you have to have a plan. Just like when you're trying to turn your business around, you can't do it without a plan. If there's no plan, there's no execution, no accountability, nothing to hold yourself to. Yeah. There's so much haphazard. Yeah. You know, marketing that's that's done by small businesses in general. Right. Well, you know, one thing, another thing that the plan does, and I, I learned this just my myself, is when you have that plan in place and that salesperson walks in the door, sends you an email, calls you on the phone from this magazine or from this new shiny thing or whatever it is, and they're giving you that strong... I mean, there were times where we ended up putting an ad in a magazine because somebody walked in the door and we just 
didn't say no. But now we can say, you know what? That doesn't fit into my plan. I already put that together. I already know what I'm doing for the whole year. And I'm sorry, just check with me next year or something like that. Yeah. And then we've actually had the salespeople before the good salespeople. They'll say, well, how do I get into the plan? Yeah. Right. And, when, when are you planning? And that's when it's okay. Well, give me all of the information so yeah. that I can make an educated decision. Right. You know, and, and not just an okay, because somebody walked in the, in the door and showed you another marketing technique. That's what we see so much of. It's like, oh, well, you know, I've got this magazine ad over here and I'm doing the, they call it the tube mailer, you know, yes. where it's got like a hundred different businesses ads right. in it inside of a tube that they put in everybody's mailbox. You know, I'm doing that over here and I got a radio advertisement over here and I got a billboard over here and you look at them and none of them look the same. Mm-hmm. None of them have the same messaging. It's no just call to this, action. it's this haphazard way of doing marketing and people have no idea whether it's working or not. Well, right. and there, you know, let's just say, for example, that, that piece in that magazine, you know, you signed up for it and the magazine's graphic design team threw an ad together for you based on their history, no knowledge of the automotive industry, what works, what doesn't work, all of that. And like Brian said, it, it just does not even go with any of the other marketing that you've been doing. So that's definitely a big point for people to really take home is, is the marketing plan. I love that you suggested that. I think we've even pitched that as a class for Vegas this year, which will be perfect timing because that's in November. November. And you know, that's, you know, some people might be like, well, when, when do I create a plan? Well, first of all, if you don't have one now, right. (laughs) Right. Don't wait till November, but then get on an annual kind of plan. Or, you know, if you can't look at that big of a picture, then try to do it on a quarterly or a monthly basis at the worst case scenario, but absolutely try to do one yearly if possible. And there's so many, so many great things you can put content around that happen every year Mm -hmm. that you can take all those things and put them in the plan for next year. Like you've got the car care month, you've got national puppy dog day, you've got first responders Day. all those things can roll over year to year. And Mm -hmm. then you put the other stuff around it. And, and then just go from there. Well, and some of the really big things are, you know, and, and, and you as a coach, you would be able to help the shop owner to see this if they don't realize it already. It took us about, I don't know, a couple of years to realize when we had our shop in North Carolina. So you, these are the things that are not applicable to every other shop, right? It's your shop. But our numbers told us that every year, October was going to be very difficult. Why? Craziest thing ever. The North Carolina State Fair. I, I, every state goes through that. It, it's it's crazy, but if but you we found know a way to market around the state fair. Yes, if you know it's coming, yeah, then you can plan around that. Well, and so that's a whole other thing. Mm-hmm. Like Christmas happens the same time every year. Yep. Thanksgiving Back happens to the same school. year. Back and then to I, school's a big one. Yeah, and yeah. everybody complains about it. And I'm like, okay, so what did you do in June for back to school or the state yep. fair or whatever? And they're like, well, nothing. I'm just resigned to the fact right. that I want to suck in October exactly. because, of, because of the fair. Or that I've heard people say, well, you know, I do really well in whatever, you know, January, February, April. I just put money aside because I know that October is going to be bad. No, no, no. Just work let, around it. Let's just make October awesome. And then yeah, go. exactly. If you have a, a true marketing plan, what you're doing is every month you're looking and you're making notes and you know, how, how was it this month? Right. Mm-hmm. So that when you're doing planning for the next year, you can take that into effect and your marketing plan should be a, a living thing. It's not something that you address every year. It's like a rolling 12 month mm-hmm. plan. So, you know, every month you're looking and you're saying, okay, well, we had this it was back to school or the state fair or whatever it was that, you know, difficult for us to keep our, you know, our car count up. So next year we need to do something about that. And then you plan for that, you know, in our case with the, with the state fair, we, um, you know, now it's a little bit different now uh, because you've got Uber and Lyft and all of that, but you could actually use that to your advantage. But what we did at that time was we offered people a free shuttle to the fair while their car was being worked on, and we gave them free ride tickets. Oh, nice. It was like a tiered approach, right? right? So if you spent this much, we gave you a ride to the fair. If you spent this much, like tier two, we gave you a ride to the fair and tickets for entrance. And then if your ticket was third tier, you got a ride to the fair, you got entrance to the fair, and then we got you the ride tickets, which was an additional cost. And people loved it because, I mean, some of the parking was oh, yeah, a mile drop, away or from Or it's the $20 fair. for parking. So we would drop them right off at yeah. the gate. 
You could do that during football time yeah, or yeah, anytime, any type of events. So were you guys able to work any kind of a discount with the state fair for no. like right now? Mm-hmm. We tried. <laughs> no, and I mean, in the scheme of things, the amount of stuff that we were buying, you know, it wasn't enough to get any kind right. of discount from them. Okay. Cause but. you know, sometimes you're marketing, right? So it's not that so many people, it wasn't, we didn't have an overwhelming number of people that used it, but the number of people that talked about it. Okay. Yeah. Was you know what I'm thing. saying? Oh, yeah. Like, it's PR that you can't, you can't buy that. You can't. Right. And so there were so many people that just talked about us. And then, I mean, they didn't even come in the door, but they were spreading the word and people were, you know, so, I mean, you want people in the door and we did have that, uh, especially the, the clients who would have come in, but they were like, I'm too busy. I really need to do this later. Look at the problems that people are having, the objections and, and work with that. And, and that's the same thing with anything like selling service in the, in the shop, anything else, people are throwing up hurdles and it's all about how you overcome those hurdles. If, if, if somebody throws up roadblocks and you can knock them all down, mm-hmm. then they have no choice but to say yes. Right. Well, Chris, we appreciate you being our guest today. If somebody wants to find you, what is the best way? Uh, you can email me, Chris, at autofixsos.com, or you can go on the website, www.autoshopcoaching.com, or you can listen to my weekly Blitz podcast on the Aftermarket Radio Network. All right. Thank you. All right. Thanks for having me. I'm, I'm like sitting out here. We got golfers out already. Um, and then, of course, Epcot Center looks like one big golf ball. I just want to whack the heck out of it. Anyway. <laughs> You've been listening to the Auto Repair Marketing Podcast with Kim and Brian Walker. Follow the podcast on your favorite listening app. Find their emails in the show notes and visit them at shopmarketingpros.com. Let Kim and Brian know what you want discussed because they're all about advancing the aftermarket.